Greetings, this is Tony Broom Ministries. By the way, to get started, let's have a little geek talk. Our podcast sessions are available on your favorite podcast platform like Apple, Amazon, TuneIn, Stitcher, and the list goes on and on. You can also get us on your smart speaker. Just try waking the smart speaker and saying, play Tony Broom Ministries podcast. So let's get going. Our session this time is entitled Salvation and Divine Favor Promise. This is the book of Jeremiah. God restores lives that have been broken by sin. Thank God that He is a life restorer. He is a sin forgiver. He is a chain breaker. If you've got pain, He's a pain taker. If you've got chains, He's a chain breaker. Our golden text Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 37. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and great wrath. And I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely. God will restore His people. It is amazing how people try to figure out God and put Him in one facet or one box or the other. They either try to make him a God of love, all love, or a God of wrath. He is both a God of love and a God of wrath, if he has to be. He's a God of love because he wants to be. He's a God of wrath if he has to be. So when he says, I will send my people into captivity, they have sinned against me, they have broken my heart, I will send them into foreign lands. And now he turns around and says, I will restore them to their land and cause them to dwell safely. I have driven them out in my anger, in my fury, in my wrath, great wrath. But now I will restore them and bring them safely. Well, that's my God. You cannot figure out my God. You cannot understand all about him. But it sure is nice to trust in him. Judgment foretold. God has told that judgment is coming. We're in verse 1 now of Jeremiah 32. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison which was in the king of Judah's house. He had been shut up there, not because he had done anything wrong, but because he had given the king the true word of the Lord, and he didn't like it. Well, the scripture, let's let the scripture tell us. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Wherefore dost thou prophesy, and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city unto the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, shall not escape out of his hand, out of the hand of the Chaldees, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and shall speak with him mouth to mouth. And his eyes shall behold his eyes. And he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there shall he be until I visit him, saith the Lord. Though ye fight with the Chaldeans, ye shall not prosper. Now, that was Jeremiah's word. He had given the true word of God. He tried to get the king of Judah to go out to the enemy. And I know this sounds strange to submit and surrender to an enemy. But in so doing, he would have saved many lives of people at that time. The king could not hear of such. How do you tell me that I shall go and submit to this enemy? And he gave all these excuses. I'm afraid. He will kill me, and all this kind of stuff. Jeremiah pleaded with him, Hear the word of the Lord. And the king became angry, and he shut him up in prison. You're prophesying falsely. You're making me mad. And Jeremiah had told of the judgment that was coming. Prophetic and symbolic action. Verse 6, And Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Hanamiel, the son of Shalem thine uncle, 
shall come unto thee, saying, Buy thee my field, which is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it. So Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, came unto me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said unto me, Buy my field, I pray thee, that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of inheritance is thine, and the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. God gave him this unusual word, saying, Your cousin is going to come to you and offer to sell you a field that is yours by inheritance, and you have a right to buy it. So he comes to this prophet of God who was shut up in prison, and he gives him this proposal. Buy my field, which is in Anathoth. And I bought the field of Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, that was in Anathoth, and weighed him the money, even seventeen shekels of silver. And I subscribed the evidence and sealed it, and took witnesses and weighed him the money in the balances. So I took the evidence of the purchase, both that which was sealed according to the law and custom, and that which was open. And I gave the evidence of the purchase unto Barak, the son of Neriah, the son of Maaseah, in the sight of Hanamiel, mine uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. This was a great move. It was a move of faith because how could he do such a transaction in such a bad time? People think that believers have to react to the things around us in this world. And we do, to a certain extent, we're affected, of course. Everyone is affected by the economy and by things that are around us. If there are high interest rates, it affects believers and non-believers alike. But believers are not bound by this economy system of this world. We live in God's economy. Jeremiah instructs Barak to put the evidence of the purchase in an earthen vessel that it may continue many days. This is proof that the Lord has said that houses and fields and vineyards will be purchased again in this place. Jeremiah turns his attention to God in prayer and supplication. After Barak leaves, after Hanamiel the cousin leaves, after the witnesses leave, everybody's gone. And now Jeremiah and God have a little prayer time. There's even a song written about it in the form of a neat little praise chorus. Ah, Lord God, Thou hast made the heaven and the earth by Thy great power. Ah, Lord God, Thou hast made the heaven and the earth by Thine outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for Thee. Nothing is too difficult for Thee. Great and mighty God, great in counsel and mighty in deed. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing is too difficult for Thee. Jeremiah pours his heart out. Lord, You told me to buy this field. I don't understand it, but I did it anyway. You've done all these things for your people. Now they have sinned against you, and you have delivered them into the hand of the Chaldees. In the natural, this seems ridiculous. How in the world, and why in the world would God tell him to buy a field? And he's there shut up in prison. Here the prophet is, shut up in prison, buying land as if he were a free citizen or an investor of some sort. Furthermore, the city is delivered into the Babylonian captivity. Why in the world would you be buying land when the city is smitten, besieged, and delivered into captivity? It's because God knows what's going to happen. Salvation and divine favor assured. Verse 36, And now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, whereof you say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries, whither I have driven them in mine anger and in my fury and in great wrath. And I will bring them again unto this place. And I will cause them to dwell safely. Israel, and I want to tell you this right now, my beloved, 
on the power of the Holy Spirit. Israel is promised that land. Israel will dwell in that land again. Israel will dwell in their land forever. I don't care what the Arabs say about it. I don't care what the Jordanians say about it. I don't care what anybody says about it. Israel will dwell there. God will see to it that they inherit that land forever. God gave it to Abraham. God gave it to David, and they will dwell there forever. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and for their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. God said, I'll fix it where you will want to love me. Well, you will want to serve me. You'll be doing it of your own will, but I'll cause your will to work. God is a great God. Praise God for such a wonderful God as he is. He can give you the desire to do what's right, and he can make it look like you're the one who's wanting to do it all along. And he gives you the want to. He'll help you want to, and he'll give you the want to to start with. It's by grace through faith, and yet you're still a free moral agent. And this all works. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. Praise be unto the Holy Ghost God. Glory to God. For thus saith the Lord, like as I have brought all this great evil upon this people, so will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. He is a good God. Good God does good things. And fields shall be bought in this land, whereof you say it is desolate without man or beast. It is given into the hand of the Chaldees. Men shall buy fields for money and subscribe evidences and seal them and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin and in the places about Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah and in the cities of the mountains and in the cities of the valley and in the cities of the south. For I will cause their captivity to return, saith the Lord. God will return the captivity of his people. Well, my beloved, we have gone somewhat through Jeremiah chapter 32. What about you and I? Where do we stand with God? Why do you keep waiting about this thing of salvation? If God is such a good God, and he is, if salvation is such a free and wonderful gift as it is, why do you continue putting off the greatest decision you'll ever make? Why have you not made Jesus your Savior and your Lord? Receive Him as your Savior and make Him your Lord today. He wants to do you good. He wants to bless you. He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. When you stand before God one day, it will either be at the Christian judgment where you receive your rewards or it will sadly be at that white throne judgment. Those at the white throne judgment will be there because they're lost. They are there because they're lost. But they go to hell because their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Those whose names were not found in the book were cast into the lake of fire, which is a second death. They will burn forever and ever and ever. Life is not a game. Hell and heaven is not a game either. It's time to get right with God. It's time to do more than just give Jesus the wheel. It's time to give Him the whole universal joint. It's time to give Him the whole transmission, the whole thing. Turn your life over to Jesus Christ. He has a plan. He has a purpose for your life. He is waiting on you. He wants to save you, sanctify you, spirit fill you, heal you, bless you, do you good. He wants to fulfill His plan and purpose for your life. Let Him do it. Right now, 
while you have the opportunity. Don't wait any longer. Salvation and Divine Favor Promised has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries. <laughs>